Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, we have our credit chats dedicated to credit policy. And uh, today, I for today, for this event, I invited my professional, nearly friend, Ragey Nasser, who is uh, joining us from, uh, from United Arab Emirates, from Dubai. Hello, Ragey. Hello, Andre. How are you doing there? Great. Nice to be here. And thank you for the, for, the invita for the invitation and for the opportunity to discuss this very important topic of credit policy. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. So um, with, uh, with regards to our today's agenda, ladies and gentlemen, please type your questions in the chat and uh, me and Ragey will be doing our best to answer them either in the flow of our today's discussion or in the end we will have today would it would be a little bit shorter than usual uh we will have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers but otherwise if, if we won't if we won't uh, be able to answer all the questions we will find the way to answer them via social media so feel free to ask your questions we do like and appreciate them so Ragey, if you don't mind let's start yes of course please. okay so our our today Today's our to, our first question is quite simple. You've seen, uh, you already participated in the research I did on the LinkedIn about the, what is the worst possible credit policy, and there were many opinions that the worst policy is the absent one. So there is no credit policy. So our today's question, our today's first question will be. Is there something worse uh, than the absence of credit policy? I will add a little bit more pepper to that because I believe we both seen that uh, there are companies in the world who do operate and continue to survive without credit policy. So if they're able to survive, so company somehow is able to live without credit policy, but is there something worse? So, please, what's your opinion about that? Well, as as you have seen on LinkedIn, yes, there is worse than not having a credit policy. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, there are several companies across the globe where they worked for years and years without having a policy. But the worst for me is actually uh, two things. The first thing is having a policy without writing a policy and, and proceeding with a policy without including all the, uh, the concerned departments. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is very, very risky and, and, and will create lots of, lots of challenges moving forward when you implement the policy. So mm -hmm. this is one of the things that I, I would certainly consider being worse than not having a policy. And the second thing is having a policy after discussing everything with all departments and at the end of the day, your, your, your company is not adhering to the policy. This is, I consider, catastrophic. If you have a policy uh, implemented and this policy is not adhered, uh, this is a catastrophe. Well, uh, if there is a policy, because that here is a tricky question. If there is a policy which is not adhered to, could we conclude that this is technical meaning the, the, the technical meaning of that that there is the policy is absent uh, not always sometimes the policy is there in some of its uh, uh, phases but in yeah. other phases it's not there for example let me give you an example when yeah, you, let's, let, let's see practical examples so yeah when yeah. you when you write a policy and you want to include specific documentation to be obtained from a customer like for example, the 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 trade license, the the commercial registration, the tax uh, mm -hmm. number. So these are all important documents to be kept under under your custody because it will it will eventually be needed in case you want to 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 investigate the customer or even if you want to go legal with the customer. Sometimes some of the companies uh, are not adhering to this. And uh, even if you write it down in the policy as one of the parameters of accepting mm -hmm. uh, uh, a customer, sometimes sales department and commercial team are not 
strictly adhering to getting these documents. And this eventually creates a big mess behind uh, when, you, when you want to use these documents later. And if, you, if, the credit and if the credit policy and the credit team is not adhering to the fact of rejecting a deal when these documents are not there, then you are compromising the whole process. So sometimes there is a policy, but there is, there is a, a miss of adherence to part of the policy. And here comes the problem. Uh, I believe this is more than a serious problem because when you mention license, uh, we are already talking not about the credit risk, we are already talking about the compliance risk, exactly. which is significantly more serious than uh, significantly more serious than, uh, than than whatever you 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 may imagine because. Um, uh, I, I will give you I will give you an example of how serious is please. this because I've faced this before. It was oh, you I already faced it, that. Yes, it was a situation where where sales team wanted to engage with the customer in a new deal and mm -hmm. we requested documentation. And when they when they provided us with the documentation, we discovered that the trade license is expired. Okay. So we said, okay, this trade license is expired. We will not be able to sign. The, uh, the contract, we need an updated version. Uh, we need to see the renewal of the trade license. We, I can tell you that it took us like five days going in a fight uh, with the commercial team and sales team, trying to convince us that they will bring the document once we sign the contract. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I refused uh, and, and the, the matter was escalated to management. And eventually management accepted to sign the contract without getting the, uh, the proper renewal documentation. We signed the contract and we delivered our products. And after like three weeks, we discovered that the company that we have just sold our products does not exist anymore. So no. uh, this, was, this was a serious breach to the policy. This was a serious breach to the compliance of, of a policy and uh, may, may, I, may, may I interrupt you for a sec and just to ask so this the management accepted to sign a contract with the customer because you know existence of license or you know having a license is actually a legal requirement exactly so it was uh, it was done despite the breach of legal requirement it was done without uh, w w w putting in consideration the, the breach of documents. Mm -hmm. And here comes, here comes a very important point which we need to share with all our colleagues here in this discussion. When you are in a credit department or when you are creating a credit policy, you have in parallel to create something called compliance report. This sure. is critical and very important aspect of your credit policy. In this compliance report, I urge you all to add all the cases that had a breach to the policy, okay? Put the value of the case, put, the, put a short explanation about the case, okay? And discuss it with the management on a quarterly basis. Let's see, it will let you see, you and your management, what was the, the, the outcome of this decision, Maybe sometimes the outcome does not appear like in, in two, three weeks, but it appears mm -hmm. like a couple of months later or maybe six months later. But it's, it is important to review with your manager the outcome of all the breaches that has been taking place uh, out, of, out of, the, uh, uh, of the context of the, of the policy. This is very important. Yeah. Uh, that's that, that's a more than valuable point because I I will just move a little bit back to that uh, because legal requirements seem to be um, like something obvious but uh, just not but very often just because it is not written properly in the internal documents the company may face a breach of that and. Uh, you know, I created a thing. You might you might see that, which is called credit risk hierarchy. Yes. Um, and um, what I found is that there are two uh, two risks uh, mainly. It's a risk of fraud, 
risk and compliance risk, which I mean, and specifically compliance risk is very important just because the exposure to that and, you know, you know, probable impact of compliance risk could be significantly higher than the understanding of, of even biggest customer. Yes. But it is it is dramatically serious for the business. So that's uh, you you surprised me to, to say that there is some somebody who does that, but okay, I mean yeah, many, there are, there many are, things. There are several companies that do that because they don't understand the consequences. And this is the importance of having uh, a professional uh, manager, a professional mm -hmm. manager who has an experience about this, because when you say it, let's let's say let's because I'll tell you my example because my example is the most simplest and the clearer one. I said to the management, this will be a pure failure. Uh -huh. They did not uh, agree, and they said, no, we will continue with the deal. Okay, I said, this is going to be very risky, and we will lose the money. They did not accept. When you when you give the hint one time. And when you show the risk one time, and again, another case happens and you show the risk the second time, the third time, I'm sure your management will tell you, okay, do whatever you see right. Okay, it's, it's about a trial and error. When you have something new yes. to your company, yes. it's, the credit policy is like each and every aspect of our life, guys. It's, it's a new thing if, if it's not there already in the company. So when you implement it, it's not easy to be implemented and let's be clear, credit policy is one of the most difficult aspects of, of, of the operation of a company because it puts limits to many things. And, 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 and when it puts limits to many things, it needs to be uh, uh, drafted carefully and, and it needs to be also ed educated to others because sometimes others do not have the knowledge about credit policy. They do not understand what is it actually. And, and, and this is the part of the credit manager who needs to start educating others yes. and taking the time to give them examples and to show them how important it is to have a policy. Well, uh, what I found throughout my career is that um, the final product of credit, of credit manager's job is actually credit policy set within the company. Yes. It doesn't matter, you know, all the other results just undersign that this culture exists, like low bad debts, low overdues, good sales, understanding between sales and finance, and all the other aspects of credit management, but just, just found that thanks to our today's discussion. So the main product of, of a credit manager is a credit culture within the company. Um, since I have to answer, at least formally, uh, to the to the question, I would say that the worst uh, situation is when the company changes conservative, you know, replaces conservative credit policy by liberal one, and next week they come back to conservative policy. Then they come back to the liberal one, and this happens, you know, with 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 the, with, with the interval of one week. I've seen that with my own eyes. Hopefully, I didn't work for that company. But I think when, when I have to explain, I always see that uh, this is the best way, the best possible way to kill your own business. You know, to, to make disturb your customers, your employees, your suppliers, nearly everybody by, by just being inconsistent. Yes. You know, wrong credit policy, I mean, conservative policy can give you results and then give you feedback. But when you change it from, you know, from black to white every day, yeah. Wow, well, that's uh that's uh, that's important. But again, coming back to the credit policy itself, um the credit policy could be set in many different ways. I do remember very nice explanation uh, from uh, Glenn Bullivant that the credit policy um, could be just, you know, number of customers and a number of customs within the organization and, you know, five, five, 500 pages guidance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from, from this to that, and, you know, this, this uh, internal customs may operate just because the chairman says so, and so on and so forth. But um, if we try to define 
between us two. Uh, what is really the credit policy? Because I give you again one 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 example. I used to be an international credit manager responsible for international business, and I was asked I was asked by my higher management and rewrite a credit policy. I said, "Do you mean?" Well, what, what do you understand? Then I asked, what do you mean under the credit policy? And a set of rules and set of, let's say, policies, how we manage credit. I said, I cannot write a credit policy which would be equal to, uh, to external customers or all the customers were export mode. I mean, customers in 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 United States and in, in Japan and Russia and and Switzerland and UK are different. I cannot put of them, and I got nearly one customer, one country set uh, set up. So, if you want me to write a credit policy, really a policy, I cannot do that I, because I need to write whatever seventy policies. Yes. This because. On each in each country we have different situation, different market, different setup, different competition, and so on and so forth. So this is about 70 policies. So we align that we will have more or less synchronized collection procedure for everyone. And for the rest, we will be we will be using common sense. But I never thought that we, we have an absence of credit policy because we had the same credit department responsible for these customers and there was really the same culture applied to every of them. So yeah. I don't believe we should put, you know, this equal mark between no. the credit policy and the, you know, written document or whatever number of pages it takes so when we have absolutely to absolutely not absolutely well when not. we have to define what is the credit policy well, um, how it should look like i'll give you i'll give you a very short and uh, and, and to the point answer it needless to a be proper, short my it uh, might be okay. different so please don't a restrict proper, yourself a proper credit policy what is what is the benefit of having a credit policy from my perspective, it's one thing. It's having a successful order to cash cycle because we know that you can sell, okay? Yes. And eventually you will not get your money. Or maybe yes. you, if you are strict too much, you will not be able to sell. So the credit policy is there to make sure that you sell your product, yes. This is a very important aspect of the business or mm -hmm. else you will not have the company. But it also makes sure that you get your money at the end of the day. Because if you don't sell, you will seize your business. But if you don't collect your money, you will bankrupt. Well, I, uh, I you know, the, the, this nice idea, uh, this nice idea I explained once uh, to, to, to in one of discussions. said, finally, in the end of the day, it doesn't matter what, which way business loses money. Either it is lost customer or bad debt or whatever or or, or unnecessary expense. Yeah. Well, there is there is a difference. Uh, if you remember, we had one of the articles which you engaged in relation in relation to uh, cost of losing a sale and uh, a sales opportunity. We will speak about that. Cost, and cost of of losing uh, your money, your actual money after you sell your product because there are huge differences between both of them. So I think we will need to speak about this just to give a glimpse to others about uh, when, when, whenever you're... you're uh, let's do that, are... because that, that, that's important. I see the Mohammed raised hand. Uh, Mohammed, we will, we will finish this, this important item because maybe this is... I, I got a feeling that this is the question of semantic and we will include you into our discussion just and to, to, to ask your question, if you don't mind. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Yes, watching you. And also, I'm, I'm listening, I'm enjoying actually the, the, the conversation between you and Mr. Ragai. Actually, the discussion is, is going very, uh, very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I got, let me, let me, uh, let, let, let me come back to, to the, to the very, you know, to quite known, uh, sentence from Paracels, uh, who, who said that, you know, everything could be 
uh, could be a cure, could be a medication, and could be a poison. And the only the amount makes a difference. So if we lose if we lose a customer, I know cost of attracting who is is quite low, and we lose the whole amount of outstanding. So the, the question is, is the amount. So we need to pay attention to, um, to how much this really costs. I completely agree to that. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a very good example. I remember we had one of the deals previously uh, and the deal was quite, quite large. It was, the, uh, if I remember correctly, the value was uh, 1.4 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, we received all the documents, we've made the analysis, we, we completed the KYC for the customer. And at the end of the day, uh, I gave my feedback to, uh, to the management saying, we should not engage in this deal. This deal is going to be very risky. Uh, and they said, I remember the, the conversation between the management, myself and the, the commercial team, the sales team mm -hmm. saying, if we lose this, uh, this uh, this deal, it will go to another customer and it will be a, a, a critical uh, loss for our company and we cannot afford losing something like this. This is a big deal, a big customer with lots of potential for other deals in the future. Uh, I've been very consistent. No, no, no. Okay, at yeah. the end of the day, management accepted to sell to this customer. We sold to the customer and we provided all our equipments and after one and a half months, I can tell you the customer completely vanished. No payment, nothing. We cannot allocate the customer. The customer is not there. And listen to this. The customer, made the, the customer made the very, very, very beautiful, uh, uh, let's say not, not beautiful, but very clever uh, thing. He sold all our equipments in the market. So what he did is actually took our equipments, paid part of the down payment, which was nothing compared to the value of the yeah. deal, took the equipment, sold the equipment, and there is no money for my company. Why? Because the company did not uh, uh, listen to a, a critical KYC investigation result saying that this customer is is wrong, this customer is not a good customer, we, it is wrong to sell to this customer, we should stop the deal. But because of the fact that we have a competition and the deal is very high and the value is important for the company, yes. we had to sell it. Well, I, I am com I completely against uh, the you know inclusion of customers' importance into credit risk assessment. That's another. This is the but but this is the subject to another big discussion about the, how the credit risk is assessed, and uh, that's why, by the way, why I mentioned value because the methodology we use in credit engineering is quite simple. We reflect a credit risk actually customer credit worthiness in money. Yes. So it could be zero. It doesn't mean that we don't give, if customer has zero credit worthiness, this does not mean that we, we don't grant credit. This just means that all the money we give to this customer in form of credit, we're supposed to be ready to lose Every exactly. single moment. So, and then when we say about customer importance, profits, all the stuff like that, we can compare all these future benefits with high possibility to lose, high probability to lose this money any single moment. So whether or not you using your own money, you would be ready to put under risk, let's say $1,000 to N10. And, and this important. becomes very clear. It is important for companies to understand, and it, this is the role of the credit manager. Sure. It is to educate management that when you actually sell, when you lose an opportunity with $1,000, if you yes. if don't lose it and you sell this opportunity and you didn't get your payment at the end of the day, you're not losing 1000 because what will happen is you will add uh, many, many other hidden costs. You will add the, the headcounts. You will add uh, maybe legal costs. You will add 
many, many other type of costs yes. to this $1,000 that you are, you, you don't want to lose, but you will actually, when you're going to lose it, you're, you're, you're maybe going to lose like $2,000, not $1,000. So it is important when you do the mathematics and when you present facts to your management, the facts of having risks results to a cost. You have to elaborate this cost to your management. You have to give them sure. money. Sometimes they don't understand the risk that we understand. They understand money. The language is money. So sometimes you need to translate the risks to an amount of money and present it to the management. Exactly what I say. Exactly yeah. what I say. So we don't disagree because when we were exchanging these emails uh, and this conversation on LinkedIn, I do remember that that obviously the amount is important. Yeah, if this is really... Uh, Let's contrast this situation. Obviously, when there is a big order and then we got customer with low credit worthiness, that's quite clear that this deal is risky. But at the same time, if there is really a big customer, well-established company, and we are not granting them additional credit just because, you know, because of the comma in the document, that's another story. Yes. And if we lose this deal, we will lose this deal. But... Really, I completely agree with you. The, the role of a credit manager is to communicate clearly what is the risk, what risk we take, what are the potential consequences. So we're supposed to give a balanced information to management or either take decision ourselves. Where it, everything will be you know, really weighted Yes. And, and, and balanced and used in proper way. So coming back to credit policy, if I understood your idea, is that mainly it's a way how we supposed to take credit decisions in a given, in, in the circumstances customers, uh, or companies stays in. Is that? It is, it is a way of how to uh, cleverly sell our products Mm -hmm. while making sure that we collect our money in the shortest time frame. So instruction how to find the balance between the greed and fear. Well, and here comes the challenge. The balance is not a standard no. balance. You, 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 cannot, you cannot define the balance uh, uh, now or even uh, when you join a company. The balance has to be defined when you go through the company, when you go through the sure. process of the company. Uh, that's why I, I, I was telling you before uh, our colleagues join in, there is a, there is a way I've, I've, I've learned from one of my managers before. It says people, process, and system. When you join a company specifically in credit management, yeah. uh, you have to understand people uh, very, very much. You have to go to dig deep to understand the mentality of the people you're working with, and you have to understand how they think, and you have to, to create a channel of communication between you and them. And then you have to come to the process, the process that you are going to use, the process that, that the company is using now. Because remember, we discussed that some companies, they do not have even credit policy and you are implementing something new. So how they used to sell before and how you are going to transform this to another process, a new process. And the last thing is the system, as we discussed. The system is, is an important factor because you should not write a policy imagining that the policy will be implemented in a way and then you get shocked because the system that the company is using is not compatible with your idea. So you have to also understand the system sure. to create a complete picture, a complete uh, uh, flow of order to cash cycle through your credit policy. Yeah, so the, the policy is anyway, somehow it, it includes both the process, the strategy, the objectives and everything, everything. So it includes, it includes the people, by the way. Uh, people, absolutely. Yes. And uh, also, yeah, I completely agree with you. So when we say the process, we could not say, we, we could not write something if, 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 you know, if the system does not allow that. You know, we, we had a quite nice discussion in Russian. We had a discussion about the automation of credit management. And in preparation to that discussion, I found interesting thing. Uh, I just found that, well, generally speaking, without systems, like accounting systems, the credit management itself is nearly impossible. Yes. If nothing prevents, let's say, a delivery department to deliver goods to a customer 
who has an overdue outstanding. They simply judge just because they don't know that. Exactly. Well, there is no credit management. Yeah, I mean, will, there, will, there is no credit control. There, there might be some sort of management, but there is no credit control. So technically- You will be surprised, you will be surprised Andrea, when you discover that some companies actually in, in, in our time surprised. now, they don't have uh, accounting system and they cannot track properly if the customer has an overdue payment or not. Yeah, sure. Sure, I, that, that, that's what I'm trying to say. So either you have to collect all the information every day or you do that, or you need, you know, 150 people credit department just to control every customer, which could be quite expensive. But we started our discussion today uh, from the interesting point that uh, if, uh, you, and you mentioned today that uh, the credit policy is to be aligned Yes. with everyone involved, with, with all the stakeholders. So when you define stakeholders, let's say who's supposed to be co-author of that credit policy? I Because my personal understanding and what I do through, what I know through consulting career, the best way to write a credit policy, and uh, I, will, I will just briefly explain that there is a policy which is normally written of, of on half a page, maybe five, from, from five to seven main points, which explain the ways we, we manage credit, the main principles, which then supposed to be implemented in procedures yes. where this is completely the role of the credit management. And these five, five to seven points supposed to be a common work of all the stakeholders. So the, the policy itself is to be agreed, aligned among and undersigned by all of them. But when we speak, who we should, when we speak about this policy and about writing this, it could be done different, in different ways. I, I'm not insisting on that. I just found that when all the stakeholders were invited into the process of definition of a credit policy, these main principles, then implementation of a policy is going much, much, much more smoother because yes. everything is aligned in the beginning. I do agree. Uh, so when we speak about the stakeholders, who would you invite first, second, or maybe you will invite all of them? <laughs> well, if you ask me through my experience of credit policy, I would I would invite management, okay? Because mm -hmm. uh, I've I've tried before inviting uh, sales department. Yes, and I can tell you it was it was one of the toughest uh, credit policy I have implemented in my whole career, uh, because because when you when you when you try to discuss credit policy with with sales team, uh, you are just telling them that I'm going to stop part of your deals. This is what they understand. This yeah. is what well, this is not your intention, but this is what they understand. What they understand uh, that, is, that's the way they see credit yeah. departments. This, this uh, is the way they see where department. it's a place where sales uh, die. Exactly. So my sales are going to drop. I will not have a commission. So you are killing my uh, my life. Yeah. And of course this is not the truth. So my my if you if you're asking me about my approach, my approach is to to uh, to speak to the management first to tell them first what is the importance of having credit policy mm -hmm. okay what is credit policy how how what is the definition of a credit policy how we have a credit policy how What's do we their write view it? on credit policy yes. yes how do they see a credit policy how do, how do they see a credit policy and then how we are going to implement the credit policy because it's very important to them to know how they implement how how we are going mm -hmm. to implement it what are the costs of implementing a policy? Because it is also a very important aspect that money. we normally, yes, we normally ignore is that when you implement a policy, there is a cost. And you sure. have to be when when you're a when you're a professional credit manager, you have to estimate the cost and you have to uh, provide it in your analysis wide and clear. Okay. And the last thing is what is the outcome of, of having this credit policy? What what is the benefit? We are going to to see at the end of the of the of the road when we implement a credit policy. When you discuss all of this with the management, 
you are you are in 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 the first phase of uh, of educating them making them ready to accept the idea and also they will be the uh, the uh, the uh, the influencer on the other department to accept the credit policy and they will have the uh, the higher um, place of of putting pressure on other departments uh, of course after you discuss with other departments after you speak with other departments after you try to educate other departments but when when other departments say no to something and because you have already convinced management with your idea they accepted the idea and they now understand the benefit they will be the 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 the, the engine going through the road of a final product like a credit policy so i believe if you're asking me i would approach the management first uh that, that's quite long story and we, we didn't finish but uh here i would i would i would like to ask just one question does that mean that uh you know approaching and involvement of higher management makes others mainly to accept the um the fact of existence of a credit policy because that's what they are contrasting i believe because i've 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 seen that myself as well you know because if you if you just listen to 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 a sales department and when we when we speak about credit they would say please we when I mean, to to sell successfully we don't need any, any credit limits any credit terms and if you kill credit manager this would be the best thing we you can do for us and we will sell everything we will sell everything but then it's a question if um, then the, 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 there should be somebody who would say with any credit we can achieve any any volume yes but not necessarily any cash yes absolutely. this is the idea so by involvement of of a higher management we not really dictate a credit policy to say to sell marketing to to everyone we we just absolutely. make them accept or simply admit the fact that credit policy is as necessary to business as any other policy within the company thank and you for the every- explanation this is exactly what i want to say because you're not, our you're not enforcing is... you're not enforcing anything you're just Absolutely. making sure that your idea will see the light soon because if you don't do this and if you approach sales department first i'm telling you your idea might be seeing the light but not very much soon well yes uh, because um if if the let's say if we put like antagonistic position Yeah that's what i say yeah no credit limits no credit term and kill kill, kill the credit controller the same story would be for the credit controller because too many too many um, too many cre- our credit colleagues are over exercising the power of uh, the power of higher management or the power of finance and this really restricts sales and this at the same time does not does not work well for the company Yes, it doesn't work well. So, the job of a credit manager, ladies and gentlemen, is to find the balance between the two. Obviously, approach to that could be different. So, we involve higher management. Higher management, we say GM, who says final word. So, if we if we get him or her on board, uh, we got already we already get in kind of power. which give us a chance to to really implement any sort of credit policy and then who would we could we who would we call for afterwards so we supposed to sit together and then of course when you when you as i said when you discuss with management first thing i need to clarify that this is a very tricky uh, aspect when you when you speak to the management first because uh, it can go it can go both ways you can mm-hmm. either convince management with your idea and they would be very much welcoming to support you or you can basically kill your idea once and for all if you are not prepared and if you're not actually aware of how to answer all the questions that you might be facing uh from management 
you are just killing the idea before it starts. So sure. I, urge, I urge our colleagues, when you present an idea to management, when you present a credit um, a policy idea, uh, and because of the fact that this is a very important aspect in the business, you have to be well prepared to answer uh, very critical questions because they will answer. Uh, they, they will ask you this and you will have to answer. And if you don't answer, you're basically killing the idea. Uh, yes. when, you, when you get the blessing from management, I would, if, 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 if we're talking about myself, I would ask management to, uh, to prepare for a meeting and to discuss uh, the idea with the sales team. The sales team and the commercial team are the, uh, are the first to, uh, to listen to this in a, in a proper meeting, including management. And the idea has to, has to see the light through management perspective, not the credit manager perspective. That's why I'm saying convince management and let management translate the idea to sales. Of course, you are going to educate sales and you will give them all the aspects of the policy. But management is going to, to interface the idea smoothly, better than you. Well, I, I completely agree with you. And a uh, couple of couple of years uh, before we had a, we had a nice discussion, and I simply said there is a big difference between the, a credit manager and a good credit manager. Yeah, because uh, a credit manager may say this, this, and that. So we have to sell goods for one billion dollars this year, but this and that and that customer are too risky. So I don't know what all. So we were supposed to find another one and so on and so forth. Whereas the good credit manager would say this billion dollar sales requires this amount of receivables and portfolio risk is like this and potential credit losses could be like this. So the comprehensive cost of credit given of credit required to this to to sell this billion dollar would be this from this to that and we can manage it this 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 and that way and when you come with numbers and as you rightly said i, I found that through my own experience independently from you but i can only confirm that language of money is clear to everyone Yes. If you come with a clear explanation that this will take this, this, and that cost, and, uh, and uh, management takes a decision based, you know, based on, on information from both sides, from what is the opportunity, what is the risk, what is the cost, this becomes much more clearer for them and much more convincing even for our sales colleagues. Because, exactly. And, um, exactly. you know, one thing is, uh, you know, always, always sitting in my mind is that I, I used to ask this question myself for 10,000 times, 10, times. I use other uh, credit specialists and we, we come to this very simple conclusion. Exist, the, the only... How to say the only point which justifies existence of receivables taking all this cost, all this risk is, is, is support of sales. Yes. Otherwise, there is no reason for receivables to exist. So the main stakeholder of, of credit management is actually sales. Yes. But it doesn't mean they're the only stakeholder. It doesn't mean we're supposed to say yes to everything because we are responsible for this edge between volume and cash. So because the, we are standing here and we are converting, you know, good, nice products or beautiful products into nice cash on our bank account or in our pockets, which, 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 which means cash in our pockets in the end. And... Uh, at the same time, the credit policy is actually the, the, and you know, all these people involved, including marketing, by the way, including logistics. Logistics should not be forgotten. Uh, accounting, finance, you know, this, this everything is supposed to be taken into account. And the, my, my understanding is that good credit manager and every company is supposed to have good credit manager supposed to play the role of moderator exactly of 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 all of them because what i'm trying to say we we, we often discuss this uh, 
this uh, this issue between credit or finance and sales, but there is also logistics, there is also marketing, there is also treasury, and they got they 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 got okay maybe they got smaller stake, but we cannot do this operation without them. Exactly. We, exactly. The company is unable to operate if treasury does not does not do their job properly because they we, we have also to pay we have to collect we have to place money we have to invest money and so on and so forth and we supposed to supply we credit managers supposed to supply treasury with cash there is logistics and we supposed to help to do them their job because they are deal with uh, you know with uh, they are dealing with um, you know warehousing with the transportation is is everything and you know thanks emilio legal department absolutely also legal also security we all are in interconnection so what i'm trying to say is that credit management is a really a multifaceted role Staying yes. really in the in the heart of the business, and we have to satisfy interests of all of them. Just because their interests is actually our interest in the end of the day. Exactly, it's a, it's 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 the company interest. It's 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 at the end of the day, what we are doing here is trying to enhance the company business, trying to yes. minimize risk, trying to make sure uh, our sales opportunities are going to grow as well as are going to be translated to money. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, whatever people say, you either you either sell or get money or you, you say avoid bad debts. That's, that, that's the issue of credit management. And that's the beauty of our profession because we have to do both at the same time. Help to sell and avoid overdue and avoid bad debts. And do this everything at reasonable cost. Because otherwise there is no need in us. Everyone, everyone can do it. Everyone can improve yes. receivables at cost of sales, or can do over trading. You know, uh, achieve achieve higher sales at cost of receivables despite bad debts and overdue. So everyone can do that. Yes, yes. Uh, I can see that we have lots of. Uh, yes, I see. So let, let, let's let's try. It. Uh, but I give a promise to Mohammed to you know to unmute him. So, Mohamed, please. Uh, it took longer than I than I expected, but please. Uh, here is here, yes, here sure. is to answer question. First, first of all, yes. Thanks so much for the uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity. Uh, 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 here's the, the 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 point I would like just to. Uh, uh, the the point I would like just to uh, clarify here or highlight it that uh, the the credit policy should be written by a committee, not only by the credit manager, and then to be spread out to all departments in order to be adhered. I, I, totally, I, I'm totally disagree with this. The idea here is that it should be written by a committee in a workshop. So the credit manager would make us maybe uh, something like uh, a draft for it, then will be invited all the CFO, director of sales and marketing, the uh, the any other parts in the operation then we all will be sitting on a round table and will be will be discussing the credit policy uh, the credit manager for sure will not be 100% uh, aware of everything in the operation so we don't want we, we, uh, we would like uh, we would like to support the operation at the same time while we are writing a credit policy well completely agree and that's that's the way i used to work and both is a corporate uh, corporate credit manager and a consultant as well so the idea is in one way or another again gave a very nice method just to you know to engage general manager uh, there are other ways just uh, in terms of process i won't be bothering you that much but the idea is to get Mm, as to engage sales manager, marketing manager, general manager, CFO, treasury, uh, head of logistics, all this head of legal, head of security, if possible, in the same room uh, and do a facilitated discussion how to define and how to find the balance pre-balanced principles of managing credit within the company, very generous one. And then this would be a job of a credit manager to retranslate this 
let me call it poetically, management will into the procedures, uh, which which supposed to be followed to every day uh, in, in day to day operations to make sure, and you know to to make sure we achieve what we want to achieve because we may create any policy. You know, it's. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's not very big deal, uh, you know, to make to make the paper mud either with the print or with the handwriting to write a policy which which I believe supposed to work. I, I, I could not know everything, even being genius. Therefore, I need to, I need an opinion of all the people and uh, of all the people involved and make sure that's what what, what we said today with Ragay. Uh, all of their interests are somehow satisfied, not in full because. Some of interests are conflict and sometimes they're exactly. exaggerated, but I was going to, to mention this. Thank you for yes. mentioning it. Please. Yeah, when you, uh, of course, you have to speak to other departments and you have to get their input and you have to, at the end of the day, uh, modify part of the policy. Sometimes you may find yourself uh, uh, accepting some aspects of, of, of the other's opinion while you are not 100% convinced, but if this is a new product to the company, if the credit policy is a new yeah. product to the company, you might sometimes compromise. But at the end of the day, remember, it is your policy. The policy here is to, to secure the company. So whenever there is a conflict and whenever there is another opinion which you see not valid and risky, you have to raise your hand. Sure. And you should not. You should not keep silent. You should not say, "Okay, I, I, I'm going to compromise this." No, there are limits of your compromisation, and you need to say no. You need to know when to say no and when to to provide the proof that this idea is not valid because of one, two, three, four, five. So yes, discuss it with all the department. Yes, modify it whenever needed. Yes, compromise a little bit, but make sure that you're final goal is to secure your company. Securing your company means more sales and at the end of the day, getting your money. It's, it's not about getting the money. Impossible to disagree, really impossible to disagree because, uh, I mean, if you keep silence, if you professional, being professional in credit, keep silence about credit matter, sooner or later, it will, it will come back to you in the worst possible way. And, so, and also... Least, also, if you are forced, because somehow I've, I've, I've been through this before, sometimes I was forced to accept some compromisation in the credit policy, okay, and I, I, I was not agreeing on this, it, yes. was not, it was not my idea, but because of the fact that other departments had some major influence on management in, in these types of, 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 uh, of, uh, of challenges, so we accepted this. Uh, but I, but I did a very, very good thing. Uh, I, I, I highlighted this as one of the high risks, and I've started to add all the deals related to this high risk in the compliance report. Okay, at the end of the at the end of the first half of the year, we went through the compliance report, and I showed management that when they compromised the policy by accepting this condition it led us to these types of losses. So immediately in the first revision of the policy, while I did not accept this at the beginning, but remember, you have to be very smart. You yeah. did not accept this, but there was a management approval. So you went with the flow. But at the end of the day, after like six months, because you well prepared yourself, when you had the first meeting to review the policy and you gave evidences, that this part of the policy was very risky and it led to uh, maybe millions of losses, immediately management asked you to review it and to modify it and you put back your condition that you had presented at the beginning. So it's very important, even if you are forced to accept something, please keep a record of all the deals that is involving this part so you make sure to present it to management later. Absolutely. Yeah, please. Sorry. Uh, Hundred percent agree with uh, you with this uh, with this uh, issue. Uh, normally, when we are uh, when we are forced to accept some ideas, we are not uh, we are not feeling well with regards to it. 
we are recording the uh, our we are recording our uh, the we, outcome we are, the outcome of this of these incidents absolutely and this is only just we are uh, we are recording our ideas that uh, we are refusing this because of so and so so this in the future if there is any problem that may occur in the future so we are uh, we have left a comment here we have left a notes that this this problem might be happening so in in general yani we uh, 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 most prob the the uh, uh, the management the higher, the higher management come to support some uh, sometimes the sales and marketing uh, and ignoring some clauses in the credit management in, in the credit policy so in these ideas only we are just highlighting the issue and we are uh, escalating so in the future if there is any problem happening we are secured and also in order to implement uh, or to take in consideration while making a new policy or something like that or updating the policy. Thank okay. you. For that. Thank you. Me, Thank you very me, much. Let me answer this very quickly, Mohammed. Uh, regardless of the fact of, the, of your management uh, accepted something, accepted an idea from sales or accepted an idea from you, you and sales are in the same boat. Okay. We are in the yeah. same boat. And this is our company. And whatever, whatever if, if, if we are going to succeed or we are going to fail, we are going to do this together. So when, when we say that a comp, uh, the, the sales team has, has offered an idea and they stick to the idea and management approved, that's fine. Our role, even if we are not convinced about this, our role is to analyze because remember, you might not be convinced of an idea to sales, but it proves later to be a good idea. We're not magicians. We are gaining experience all every day, a different experience. So there might be something that could be uh, presented by the other departments, which you refuse at a at, at, at time. But later, after a couple of months or maybe after one year, you discover that this idea was a brilliant idea and you should have put this idea since the beginning in the policy. So at the end of the day, you analyze to see the result, to see the outcome of this idea, which you have been forced to add it in the policy. At the end of the day, it's not about you. It's not about sales. It's about profit or loss to the company. If the idea that has been accepted by management because it was influenced by sales is actually, uh, uh, reach, it's actually providing a loss to the company or resulting to a loss to the company, management will be the first stakeholder to say stop, we are not we are not going to continue with this. Please modify it. So coming back to the topic of credit policy and stakeholders, if we can conclude here, I would suggest that uh, this actually is not about ambition of whoever whoever it is, including general management, it's the doing best for our company and the credit policy is actually a kind of document which help us to manage credit together and how we work together on credit with other departments and this give us yeah we got a young and natalia please please but if if, if if we can do that in in short because we are getting a little bit out of schedule <laughs> yeah hello uh, i just want to ask a short question Mm -hmm. uh, what actually uh, must or should be stipulated in the credit policy, and also is it also uh, is it need to be included like uh, the the write off waiver, and also the blacklisted customers? Is it uh, are those items need to be stipulated and mentioned in the credit policy? I uh, I will try to ask quite very briefly if legislation if, if you use the blacklist for instance uh, and uh, the legislation permits using the blacklist you know whatever it is because in some jurisdictions such practices are actually illegal yes you you should include that either is is a policy or either as a separate document. However, however, you need to distinguish. Um, you need to distinguish um, the procedure itself and the policy, which my understanding is, you know, very brief document, two pages maximum, which 
support which sets the general rules uh, of managing credit within the company. And for, for the, you know, blacklist and all the other technical details are surely not to be part of the policy, but to be part of the procedures. My personal opinion is that um, distinction between policy procedures to be made because it makes it easier to to work because you know change to, to the procedures is not the change to the policy you can do that quite technically if you need to redesign the process but all the necessary steps to be taken to manage credit successfully is supposed to be written in the procedures that's for sure. Ragey, maybe you got different opinion, please. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you my opinion. Uh, well, what you are saying is 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 uh, is related somehow to the receivables policy. Uh, I, I prefer I prefer having the the credit policy as the uh, the uh, the parent policy, mm -hmm. and beneath this policy, we we should have something called receivables policy. Receivables policy defines how do we take the, the, uh, the, the process from having an order to getting the money. And this includes how we are going to follow up with the customer, the, the frequency of following up with the customer. This is very important, by the way, because you might, you might think that you have, you, have, you have sold your equipment or you have sold your product to a very good customer and he should pay like this, but he's not paying. He's not paying because you have not paid the effort to follow up with the customer to pay on time. So also uh, having a receivables policy is very important. Inside this receivables policy, yes, I do agree. You should have uh, all the other parameters that you spoke about. You should have a blacklist. Uh, uh, the, the policy, the receivables policy should say when you are going to define this customer as a blacklisted. Your receivables policy should say when you put your customer on hold. Let's say, let me give you an example. If you have a customer who bought an equipment from you like seven, eight months ago, and 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 he has an overdue at this point, he has an overdue of like four or five months, and he's requesting to buy another equipment. Are you going to sell to him or you're not going to sell to him? Are you going to extend credit or not? Or maybe your policy is saying that you are going to put this customer on hold. These are parameters that should be added to the receivables policy because receivables starts from the day you invoice and deliver your product until the day you collect your money. When, when we say we collect your money, it might be amicable, so the normal follow-up, or it might be legal through a legal agency, uh, maybe a law firm or debt collection agency. So yes, I do agree that you should include this to your policy, but let's name it a receivables policy instead of a credit policy. And by the way, the receivables policy could be part of the credit policy, and could be an independent documentation. I prefer if the receivables policy is an independent documentation because it's a little bit uh, longer and more complicated and it addresses a different department because remember, the way you are approaching your customer for collection is only related to you, not to anyone else. It's not related to sales. It's not related to marketing. It's not related to anyone else. You, as an experienced credit manager, define how you want to approach your customer when that's it well uh there, there is a significant part of the world uh, where sales managers collect cash yes uh, that's that that, that that works it works as well uh because we got actually a question from the audience which leads us to our third today's question so i i named it quite uh, quite simple policy procedure what else and uh, there is already a hint from godwin morris who says how often the credit policy should be reviewed and uh, combining all of that and since we are we are we are running out of time i will i will get it let say quite briefly so what is the one of the most important things, to my opinion, in the policy is that the procedure of credit policy review. To me, the review of credit policy is one of the most complicated and most important and most powerful uh, credit management task. Uh, because 
no credit policy could remind, you know, even perfect credit policy wouldn't remind, uh, remain so, you know, forever. We need to, we need to have a look. Uh, we need to have a look and when we have, when we need to have a look and review the credit policy, what are your markets, Ragi? Okay. Um, when, when we, when, uh, you know, what are the markets which give us a clear idea that we need to sit and rediscuss a credit policy with all the stakeholders or whatever way it is. So how do we review and when we understand it is necessary to review the policy? Well, it depends. It depends, Andrea. Uh, are you going to to try down a new policy from scratch so the company doesn't have a policy? Uh, well, let's imagine we we already have a policy, and okay. somehow we find we somehow it becomes evident that we need to review it. Yes. Uh, Bijat, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and you know that would be video, so you know you you won't lose everything with except for ability to ask questions, but you can ask them on social media. Absolutely. So yes. going back to your question, if we have a policy and we want to to uh, we, it's evidential now that this policy has to be revamped. It's, yes. it's the, there are some some things that 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 pops up immediately to give you an indicator that your policy needs to be addressed. Uh, the first thing is, uh, are you having a huge list of defaulting customers? I would say this is the first parameter. If you have a list of defaulting mm -hmm. customer and, it, and this is increasing, then you have to ask yourself why. Is it, is it because I'm choosing my customer wrongly? I'm not, I'm not doing a proper KYC, no, your customer or maybe because my, my payment terms are not uh, correct, or maybe because my follow-up to the payment is not proper, or mm -hmm. maybe my pricing to, uh, to, the, to the product is not correct. There are several elements that we need to look for. And once we find this type of failure, your customer is not paying and the list is expanding, mm -hmm. you need to stop, say, okay, I have to study everything, and I have to revamp my credit policy. Well, I would uh, I would add to this. Uh, I will I would go even even wider because the credit policy somehow is actually a, a credit support to the achievement of company strategic goals. So either we don't receive the results we expect credit results or you know where what is dependent on the credit policy so there are actually two two main flows either we don't receive the results we expect so it is either it is too many bad debts too low too high overdue or we don't achieve sales we want because if receivables don't support sales what's the reason for them to exist yes or another situation when the company changes the strategy and the new strategy may need another credit policy. In this case, we need to review a credit policy. There were a couple of questions from Tiago and from Natalia. Uh, does it mean that the credit policy only stipulates how we assess credit worthiness? Absolutely not. There are other ways, other things to include. It is much more wider because management of credit is not only risk assessment, it's not only collection, and it's not only control, but all, all these taken together. And there is a question from Tiago, would you recommend having some precise financial figures in the policy servicing as covenants, for example, companies having some leverage ratio and so on? Uh, Tiago, I, my personal opinion, I, I, will, I will ask Rage for, for, for his one. Uh, my personal opinion is that it's the, the biggest mistake in credit management we can make is to link credit decision to assessment of credit risk. You know, automatical, automatical uh, credit decision based on credit risk is affordable. Uh, that's, by the way, the topic we were discussing with Ragay before the official start of today's discussion. Um, 
the thing is, only businesses with uh, with uh, hyper demand for their products, for instance, like bank loan, can afford such a policy where you know customer with a good credit worthiness has credit, customer with a bad credit worthiness does not have credit. That's unaffordable for at least 75% of the companies in the world who have to compete and we have to choose. So in 21st century, in current marketplace, it's not a question of uh, taking risk or not taking risk just by your discretion or by your decision. It's just a question if you wish to, uh, to, to, to achieve this amount of sales, which amount of turnover and so on, it's a question how much risk you have to take. And then you're supposed to decide whether or not you, this, this, this level of risk is affordable to you, to your company's business, and so on and so forth. So I don't believe it's supposed to be like this. But following your question, Tiago, I would say that a specific model or set of models which to be used within the company to assess credit risk, a specific methodology of credit risk assessment is to be part of credit procedures. This is for sure. Okay, maybe you will add. I, I, I do agree with you because uh, it, it is different from a line of business to another line of business, and you cannot take one example for granted. Uh, let's let's say you have a company which is working in medical equipment is completely different than having a company uh, which is working for for example for elevators or cars manufacturing uh, utilities. It, 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 it depends utilities. It depends on the line of business and the risks. Uh, uh, associated with each line of businesses are completely different. Of course, there are some, some basic and straightforward risks, but there are other risks that you should be putting into consideration related to each line of business. And that's why, uh, as, as we said, if you remember, Andre, at the beginning, uh, a, a professional credit manager is someone who, has, who had the chance to work in different line of business Yes, because this is this is very important. You might be surprised, and I'm telling you this because uh, it is also important to tell this to our colleagues. You could find yourself uh, in your position, in your line of business, a very successful credit manager, and 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 for example, you want to to move to another company. You want to have a career growth, and you want to move to another company. Be careful uh, when you when you choose your next employer. Because the line of business that you are going to choose might be completely different than the line of business you are working in. And if you don't have the experience, you might be shocked and you might, you might feel that this is not the right decision to move to, to this employer. Be careful because lines of business have different approaches. They have different risks. And I urge each and every one of our colleagues, when you, before you join a new employee, a new employer, please read about this line of business carefully, understand how it works. And then when you go, listen, 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 listen before you take a decision. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, I described that in, in a bit different way, just saying that, you know, things in, in different industry, in, in, in other industry, in other country, in other, in other company, in other, let's say, group of people, Things you believe used to be constant may become variable. And if you just used to think that they are constant, like, you know, there are lots of people who believe that 30 days payment term is the best one. Why 30 days? Why not 15 days or 90 days? And uh, the same story, because there is, there is nearly whole theory about how we establish a credit term. What are the variables? How many parameters we need to have a look? And there is, um, there was a quite nice question. I believe it is very interesting and uh, about international business. Uh, again, asked by Tiago. Uh, back to companies with international business. If we have so many companies from so many countries with such different risk approaches, is it worth to even have a credit policy at first place? Of course, of course it's worth. 
of course it is important to have a credit policy and and maybe at this point we come back to the to the idea we said at the beginning uh, credit policy is a is a is a tailor made policy and it should accommodate uh, the country risks the political risks trust me it should uh, Absolutely. It, should, it should include all of this. So uh, it is important that when you write a policy, you know to which entity and which geographical uh, area you're covering uh, with this policy. And you should be aware of the risks associated in, in, in this country and in this geographical area. Uh, yes, I do believe you should have several policies. You should be uh, uh, writing these policies carefully, addressing all the countries that you have spoken about, but also inside the, 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 the frame of the policy, which is a frame written to your company. So at the end of the day, let's say uh, my frame is, uh, if, a, if a customer uh, has an outstanding uh, payment overdue for more than one year, I will not sell to this customer again. But again, for example, let's say we have a country that has a critical problem and most of the customers in this country are delaying payment. So, yes, you are saying that you will not sell to this customer again, but maybe if this customer comes to you and tell you, I'm sorry, I have been very late, I'm going to pay all of this amount, can you please sell me a new product? Maybe at this point you will sell him. So, it depends on the country, but again, it's the same frame of the policy that you have written to your company. I uh, well, I will I will add just a couple of words. Uh, first of all, obviously, when we speak about international business, well, assessment of country, especially if you got an export mode, because there are you know principal difference. If you sell to your international companies through the through the through the local entities belonging to you, or you got really an export mode where you got a border between you and the customer. But in both cases, actually, you have to make sure you properly analyze country risk, political risks, risks of hard currency convertibility is as a most uh, the most frequent one and uh, you supposed to somehow include all of the all of the possible cultural difference you know country difference uh customs everything so this is supposed to be quite complicated task to write such a credit policy that's why uh I, I continue to promote the idea is that you know you can set a general rule like risk of every customer is to be analyzed. This would be one statement within the policy, and then you will have to write, let's say, about whatever number of com of countries you work in. You're supposed to write specific procedure for every company. If you need different uh, different credit risk models for for every company this means that you're supposed to, to 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 document this everything so to make sure that whoever comes uh to make a you know part of credit management job about this or that country or group of countries or region they know what to do because you as credit manager create what is called a normative document yes. for 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 everyone and and Please remember that whatever nice job you did today about the credit policy, you will have to review it if situation changes. Yes, absolutely. So that's, that, that, that's inevitable. Uh, also, I need to, to highlight something. Please, yes. everyone, remember that your customer prior to COVID-19 is not the same customer post-COVID-19. Well... I'm telling you this because... Unfortunately, some of our customers, uh, actually some of our companies, which we have worked for, uh, they do believe that if you have a customer who has been uh, your customer for like 10, 15 years, uh, he will continue to be the same customer even after COVID-19. This is critical because we have seen hundreds and thousands of companies, large organization failing bankrupting 
losing money after COVID-19. It is our responsibility to set the rule to the management of our company saying, stop connecting your customer to the same behavior prior to COVID-19 and post COVID-19. You have to make sure to investigate your customer properly. You have to make sure to conduct your KYC properly because if you're not doing this, you're actually hurting your company. And uh, I think this will be the, you know, the last point for today, but I, I, I will add something. I believe that one, if there is one good thing COVID did to us, it highlighted that you know reliance on payment uh, on customer payment behavior is actually um, very far from being right way to assess customer risk. And uh, if we take into account, I think Natalia already already mentioned that when we really use financial statements to analyze our customer, we're supposed to remember that these are financial statements from past. So it's not only classical ratio assessment. It's not only payment behavior. It's not only KYC. This everything plus we need to do stress test. We need to turn our heads and our risk assessment from back looking to forward looking. We need to find a way to estimate how customer performance would look like tomorrow. And based on that, our credit policy. This is, this is the way, non, and not only for the, on the customer level, but also on the, on the portfolio level. So we need to calculate both future customer credit worthiness because every credit worthiness assessment is, is nothing more than, uh, than forecasting. Yes. So we were, when, we, when we look at our customer, we suppose it, it doesn't matter how liquid or how, um, how credit worthy our customer was lasted, you know, in the end of the last year. It's very, very good, very nice, but we only, we, we only have trends to see whether, because our job in risk assessment is to make sure we understand how much credit worthy our customer would be to repay the obligations to us. And plus to that, we need to estimate how much credit we would need to trade with this customer. And based on these two forecasts, whatever soft they look like is actually give us a background to recommend a decision to management to, to take ourselves. It would never be an easy job to do. Yes. Uh, I want to add something finally, uh, Andre, before... Just we, please. Is this, uh, th th there is a big difference between the, the, the understanding and the culture of credit management in the Middle East compared to Europe, uh, USA, and, and because of the fact of the uh, availability of information and other things. Uh, for example, uh, we have a complete... Uh, um, um, problem or, or challenge in obtaining the financial information of a company in the Middle East, while this is one of the basics in, in, in Europe and, and US. So not, not in US. Not, not in US. US. I, I mean, le, 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 let me tell you something. Uh, about a month ago, we were doing um, uh, credit performance measurement uh, discussion with Michael Dennis. He's professional. I believe you know him. Yeah, He's from the United States. He said about 5% of companies in the United States know real credit worthiness of their customer because for the private companies, financial statements are as unavailable as on Middle East. Okay, that's, so uh, it's, uh, that's it's, interesting. It's more or less the same interesting story. To interesting to know because we have this challenge in the Middle East and I do urge our, our credit colleagues, uh, whenever you are implementing uh, a new credit policy, uh, put a clear uh, uh, procedure in terms of obtaining financial information if the deal is uh, uh, quite significant and, and, and the, value is, the value of credit is quite high. Do not be afraid to ask your customer to provide Absolutely. financials. Do not be afraid to tell your sales colleagues that, I'm sorry, I need these financial uh, data because when you do this, 
you are actually educating the market. You're adding value to the market. I remember we had a discussion with one of our customers uh, that was like four or five years ago. Uh, this customer at the beginning, we started to deal with this customer and we requested financial information and they were very, very upset with this request. And then after like a couple of years, we had a meeting with them and I remember their GM saying, you know, Ragai, when you asked us to provide the financial information, we were very unhappy and we were, we were, we were pissed off. But then we learned from you that the importance of having the financial information are critical. And we started asking our customers to give us the financial information later. So what you're doing is you're educating the market. Please keep educating the market because when you do this, you're not only helping your company, you're helping the industry. Absolutely. I had the same experience with Middle East where we had a customer with, in Bahrain. So uh, they were refusing to provide financial statements uh, for, for good three or you know, couple or three years. And finally, they gave that because we had to review their credit line. So they provided financial statements. When, when I see that, I said, if this would be my company, I will print them on big boards around Geneva to yeah. show this is financial statements of my company. So when I said that, do you remember that Lamborghini in front of the five-star hotel? This, this, this must be Lamborghini of their credit controller. <laughs> you know, with, with, in such a company. We got last question for maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, Mohamed, please. The floor is yours. Hi, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, before evening. I ask a question, before I ask a question, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Andy for uh, organizing such a wonderful event. And uh, I suggest we should have another session for like minimum another two or three hours because this is a very, very nice topic, uh, career policy. We learned a lot, but there are so many uh, things to be discussed. Uh, so I recommend you arrange another uh, session for this. Okay, uh, my question is, uh, as, as our guys said, that this part of all Middle East is a very challenging uh, for us, you know, to implement the, the credit policy. Uh, sometimes, you know, the higher management, uh, like they bypass the credit policy itself. So, also sales team is very, very difficult to to make them understand this. This policy is not against anyone, just to prevent the bad debts. So, and at the end of the day, there are a lot of challenges to you know to implement the policy. So my question is, uh, what are the criteria to set a credit demand? Let's say your customer is requesting a million uh, credit demand, but after analyzing, after you know assessing, maybe he's not eligible for a 50K. So what are the, the key factors we should consider before setting a credit limit for any customer? This is a very long discussion. I, uh, thank yeah. you, thank you for the question. <clears throat> But we still got three minutes, so uh, 90 uh, seconds to me and 90 seconds to you. You are first. Okay, I'll take my 90 seconds. You have to consider many, many aspects when you say this customer is eligible to uh, 50,000 or 150,000 or maybe 500,000. One of the things that you will be amazed to, to, to listen to is what is, the, uh, what is the value of your product? What is the, uh, what is the uh, cost of your product? actually, and what is the break-even point of your product? What is the, when, when you are getting what you have invested, the ROI of your product, this is very important. And the appetite of risk is part of deciding the credit limit of your customer. So it's, uh, it's, it's, you will be amazed when you discover that there are hidden aspects of the business that decides the credit limit of your customer. It's not only financials and it's not only uh, information that you get and you obtain from the customer. And it's also important to mention that this is a tailor-made analysis. So I can tell you from my experience that this customer credit limit should be 100,000 and Andrea can come to you saying, no, this customer worseness should be 20,000. So this is a tailor-made based on your experience and based on your approach to the market, to the industry, and to your company, and to the product. 
since uh, thank you, Ragay. I just had uh, so if I got since I got only ninety seconds to explain, I will explain that it's a pretty simple thing, because we got a methodology for that, and this methodology is quite simple. So you have to calculate how much credit you need to give to this customer. Uh, based on the sales focus. Then you need to calculate credit worthiness, which will which gives you an idea how much credit you can safely trust, how much money you can safely trust to this customer. With very high probability, you will have a difference between credit worthiness and credit demand. And uh, for sure, credit demand will be higher than you have. And this difference is actually a credit risk you have to take. And then you need to understand whether or not you are ready to accept this credit risk in full or in part. And you will draw the line of a, of, of a credit limit between the two. Um, that's actually what I teach, uh, you know, in, in the methodology. And uh, it could be good or bad, it could be precise or not precise, but at least it is based on numbers, it is based on money. And then you decide, you know, so when to, to decide about this different, you need to compare that because this is risk. So you put this amount of money under the risk. Uh, and then you compare that with the benefit of a transaction. For example, you, you have to give to customer in order to make a deal. You, give a, you have to give a customer a million dollar and their credit worthiness is 100,000. So there is 900,000 of risk. And then you compare this 900,000 with the, let's say annual profit with this customer. And then you see whether or not you're ready to risk 900,000 to earn what? 1,000 or million or 5 million. Let's become much more clear how to answer that. But that's uh, for that you need to know. You you need to have a really a process how to define credit demand, how to define credit worthiness, and how to take how to take a decision about the credit limit. And also, by the way, that would be important topic of credit term because this would be very very demanded. Ladies and gentlemen, I do thank you, first of all, Ragay, for finding time and for sharing his inspiration and his, uh, his great ideas uh, with every one of us. And I do thank you very much for joining us in Credit Trust. Ragay, maybe a couple of words in the end. Thank you, Andrea, for the opportunity and for this interesting discussion. It was a pleasure to join you, and a pleasure to see all the uh, all the colleagues from uh, from different uh, regions, different countries. We hope that you have enjoyed our discussion. Uh, thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure to speak to you about credit uh, policy and credit management in general. Thank you. I promise. I promise we will continue with the credit policy because, as Muhammad said, uh, um, there it's, is uh, a, lot, a lot, a lot of a lot of themes to Indeed. to discuss still but for now we i do believe i do believe uh, the things we've shared together with ragay today will help you to manage your credit and i wish you from from our side to have big sales small losses and what could be sent in french bon crédit thank you thank, thank you. you have a nice evening thank you bye very bye. much thank you bye bye